Hello, everyone. This is Alan Schimmel, DevOps.com, and welcome to another DevOps.com webinar. Um, I have to apologize up front today. I have a little bit of a cold, so if you hear me coughing, I apologize. I'll try to keep that to a minimum. Uh, for those of you who have never been to a DevOps or have attended a DevOps.com webinar before, we think uh, interactive questions from the audience are a huge part of the formula and we encourage you to ask your questions. The way you ask questions for our webinars is within your go to webinar control panel. You'll notice there's a section mark questions. And if you hit the little uh, arrow or carrot so it expands, you can type your questions in there. We, though we've set aside time for questions at the end, we encourage you to type your questions in in real time as they pop into your head. This way you don't have to worry about forgetting them. They're queued chronologically, so we can, you know, the earlier you ask your question, the more of a chance that it'll get answered by our panelists. And if we have so many questions that we cannot answer them all, you can, uh, we'll have a record of it. We'll try to get you an answer to your question via um, writing email after the fact. So please ask your questions as early and as often as you'd like. We'll have them queued in there. We'll get them to you. Now, for today's webinar, I think what we, I think we're going to have a great one. Um, it, it's really about an area of DevOps that has recently really, you know, got an increased spotlight, if you will. And uh, that is the, the idea of data and databases in DevOps. You know, in worrying about the apps and the CI, CD and testing, a lot of times we, we didn't really pay enough attention to the data and database. And I think you're going to hear a lot about that today about how to integrate database automation into your DevOps tool chain. Today's webinar is sponsored by our friends at IBM, Actifio, and DB Maestro. With that being said, let me introduce you to our panel. And if we can go to our panel slide. And here's their smiling faces. And I'm sure they're all smiling back at their desk right now. First of all, a uh, man who really needs no introduction to DevOps.com webinars. He's done many of them as, as well as several interviews and articles. He is one of the uh, kind of global leaders for IBM's DevOps and Urban Code team, Eric Minnick. Eric, welcome to DevOps.com webinar. Hey, good to be back here. Uh, looking forward to it. Fantastic. Glad to have you here. Uh, the man in the middle. Also needs no introduction, really, to a DevOps.com audience. He's he's appeared on our podcast. He's written some of our most popular uh, articles here on DevOps.com, and he really has, is a pioneer in the uh, DevOps or data, DevOps for database market. A co-founder and CTO of DB Maestro, Yaniv Yehuda. Yaniv, welcome. Hi, Alan. Pleasure being here again. Pleasure to have you here. So far, everyone's sound is working great. Okay. And then third, but last but not least, happy to have with us Senior Director of Product Mar Marketing at uh, Actifio, Jay Livens. Jay, welcome. Alan, thank you. I guess I'm the newbie here, and so I really appreciate your including me. I'm excited to be uh, presenting today. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. I feel like I'm the host of the dating game here. Let's have Bachelorette number one ask her first question. <laughs> um, <laughs> there you go. You know, I really like going out on long walks at night. <laughs> In the rain. Um, <laughs> anyway, but no, that's not why we're here. We're here to talk about data and databases and DevOps, God darn it. So let, let's kick things off, Eric. If it's okay, I'm going to let you take this one. All right, let's rock and roll. Um, I, I want to start with just a little bit of context for continuous delivery because we're going to drill in in this session on where better management of data and databases fits, right? But let's step back. Why does continuous delivery matter? Well, you know, the uh, DevOps Research Association, DORA, the, those guys, they've done the studies um, and high-performing IT organizations, which we know are correlated with successful companies in the market, um, 
they do a lot more deployment. Uh, they have faster lead time from when new code shows up until it in enters production. They're going much faster. And when things go wrong, their mean time to recovery is like 100 times faster uh, than kind of an average or a poor organization. And so the capability delivered here is really profound. Your ability to go from concept to something delivering value for your customer quickly and safely is, is really important. And so we know DevOps is important and continuous delivery is foundational to all of this, right? If you look at what continuous delivery does, right, you're automating your build and deploy foundationally. So you're gonna deploy more often, right? If, it, if it's free to do a deployment, you'll do it more. Uh, that, that's Econ 101. Um, your lead time uh, shrinks, right? You're delivering continuously. You're not piling up a whole bunch of work and waiting to ship that off in a big batch. You've got a change. You're seeing if it's good. You're getting it into the hands of your customer. So that lead time is improving because of continuous delivery. Mean time to recovery, this is a little bit more subtle. Um, but because you're delivering smaller changes more often, the number of things that could cause an outage is, goes down. So people know where to look when there is a problem, they get it resolved. You've also automated your ability to do a rollback. So, hey, that, that's a, a common way of recovering. Uh, so that's good. And your change failure rate um, is also going down and, and that's correlated as well. So we have a high performing IT organization, does these things more than an average one, continuous delivery helps. And the good news here is, yeah, we kind of know how to do continuous delivery these days. The um, humble Farley continuous delivery book is, I don't know, what is it, eight, 10 years old now. Um, we've had tools in this space since 2005. Um, this basic build pipeline construct is something that's it's pretty familiar to folks in the industry, right? Developer writes some code, goes into a source control tool, it gets built stored somewhere safe, and then it gets deployed out to some sequence of test environments, and then finally delivered into production. And the goal is to control this, do it quickly, and manage dependencies the whole way through, all right? Um, so all of this um, sounds pretty easy, right? We know how to do continuous delivery, Continuous delivery helps all of the key metrics and the key metrics indicate whether we're high performing or not. Um, that leads to a pretty obvious question, which is why doesn't everybody do this well, right? And there's a couple of complications. Um, the first one that I would hit is we don't tend to ship individual builds of things, right? Um, we've got applications with a lot of moving pieces and parts. Um, you know, whether it's the, the three-tiered web app, whether it's a service-oriented architecture with a lot of web services, a message bus, a ESB, um, and a bunch of databases on the back end, right? Our applications, at least most of them, uh, have a lot of moving pieces, and we test all of those pieces together. And then we tend to release those pieces together in some coordinated fashion. And so while this pipeline is really easy and really easy to wrap your head around, this kind of a pipeline where you've got a pipeline of pipelines and you're orchestrating it and you're testing the system, deploying the system, releasing the system is a little bit more complex, right? And this is where you know, tools like Urban Code Deploy, which I look after, um, are really important because its goal is to help you with continuous delivery for um, multi-tier applications, more complex applications. And we're seeing a ton of interest um, cropping up in the microservice space, which makes a lot of sense, right? We take, you know, existing application and we turn it into a lot more smaller pieces and parts. And so keeping track of what we've tested together and releasing that all together um, becomes even more important. So this, this is a key focus for us on, on Urban Code Deploy. 
um, it's this kind of how do we keep all of these pieces and parts together problem. Now, I would observe that the other reason that we tend to do this poorly um, or we struggle with continuous delivery is that we spend most of our time in this pipeline, not building and deploying things, but testing things. And I think as an industry, um, we've done a relatively poor job of automating all of our testing. Now, I could sit back and talk to you about all of IBM's wonderful testing tools, um, but that would be a whole nother webinar. Um, but I think we're gonna focus a lot on the, how do I get my test environment ready and how do I validate things problem in the rest of this um, webcast. So um, the testing area is really, really key. That's why there's all of these stages um, between the build and production, right? Is we tend not to want to release a bunch of broken things in the prod. We tend to want to validate that the things that we have are actually worth exposure to our customer. Now, um, this is where data, and database change is really interesting because um, data is different, right? This idea in the, our, our normal pipeline that I do a build and then I deploy that build through some series of environments, it's not really a build in a schema change. And if I wanted to roll back, I'm not just taking the old build and putting it back out there. I've got to reverse a bunch of um, incremental changes and I got to do that in the right order. So this is really tricky. Um, at the same time, in our test environments, we're usually pulling in data from production, but production tends to have really large databases, and it's full of all sorts of things like our customers' credit card numbers and uh, social security numbers and all sorts of sensitive things. And so that requires a lot of care and management. So data is really, really tricky as we look at how we're doing this to delivery. And we know that our applications almost all rely on, on databases on the back end. And so if we're gonna actually be successful, if we're actually going to see things like 46 times as many deployments and 400 times faster lead time and 100 times faster mean time to recovery, if we're actually gonna be a high performing IT organization, we gotta nail the data. Uh, and this is where I stopped being the best expert. And so I'm gonna turn it over to the folks who, who really know the data problems extremely well. Um, Yanov, hopefully I set that up appropriately and um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and hand it over to you to take us into some more detail about uh, schema in particular. Uh, absolutely, Eric, thank you very much. Uh, definitely setting up uh, uh, the, the ground for me. So. Focusing on, on, on databases and, 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 and pushing changes uh, for databases is, is, as you said, not, not exactly how you do it for code. So I would definitely say that uh, uh, we see today uh, you know, continuous delivery solutions, uh, just like uh, Urban Code, doing great work in, in, in helping us set processes in place and, and create a repeatable process. Uh, deploy the same way to all environment, make sure that we actually test the proper things before they go forward. And, and creating that process is becoming more and more uh, uh, a standard of how people work. This might be in order to achieve faster time to market. It might be in other cases where you, you're not def definitely uh, delivering changes every couple of days or every week, but you still want to have that automated process in order to nail down that repeatability, because uh, large companies might have complex processes and, and a lot of handoffs, and you don't want to do that manually. You want to have like a repeatable, a truly repeatable process. But the thing is that um, once you're uh, trying to to push things forward, you have other challenges. Um, let me just show you some of the statistics that we're, uh, we've been able to to gather and, and see. So first of all. Everybody's running fast, but they're running faster and they're expecting to run even faster 
moving forward. So if you just look at the, at, at the green graphs from uh, 2017 versus the, the uh, blue ones uh, expected in, in 2018, everybody is expecting to run faster. So if you ran uh, a few releases a month, you're expecting to, to run more. If you run, uh, uh, if you are planning to go from uh, a weekly releases to daily releases, or a lot of companies are planning to have daily releases versus uh, last year. So everybody want to move faster. It's all in the name of, of uh, uh, reaching the market faster. You know, if you don't do that, your competitors will, and, and, and you just, you know, you, you, you're going to move slower with all the different implications. So I, I hear a lot of people saying, yeah, we need to move fast, break things. If something is not going right, yeah, we will create a process to recuperate. Just like Eric said, you know, you, you get your previous version from uh, the binary repository. You, you have an automated process to get that back in place. It might even take seconds to re revert back to your uh, previous version. But uh, if, if to look at another aspect of, of uh, uh, the service that, that we were running uh, earlier this year is, and that would not be, uh, uh, that is, I don't know, it's, it wouldn't be a surprise uh, to, to figure out that the faster you run, uh, the more issues you have. Because if you change nothing, you know, that it's like the developer joke, that, don't change anything, and you know. Uh, uh, if you change something daily, the the, the risk of, of, of changes is significantly going up. So you can see the green uh, the green boxes uh, for uh, weekly and daily uh, uh, changes. Uh, they're definitely uh, 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 not as as high as as quarterly or annually. So the faster you go, the more you break things. Might be so, but but if you really think about it. And you think about what can go wrong, uh, and 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 here this would be the last slide about surveys. Uh, this is what people are, are finding out when when doing uh, uh, at least database releases. Uh, they have problem around uh, code overrides, invalid codes going to the to the wrong environment, uh, conflicts between different teams. You know, a team is issuing a fix, and a next team is issuing a, another fix that overrides that. That might be. Uh, something that you need to correlate. You know, it's 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 more difficult than 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 your uh, builds in 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 .NET or, or Java, uh, and and partial updates or, or partial code going into different environments. That that's a challenge as well. So there's a lot of challenges to database updates if you do it uh, uh, carefully. If you're running fast, of course, that's that that might be a, a bigger problem. So. Uh, Talking about how we can do things better is, is all about creating a safer process. So by all means, move fast and break things, but don't break the things that are hard to fix. Don't break the database. And, and, and this is what the investor is focusing uh, uh, around. So to have a better uh, version control process, so to make sure that people are introducing changes, don't conflict with, that, with each other, have a safer release process, and I'll talk about what that means, uh, but have that in a controlled way, and, and not just safe to not break the database, but safe from a process point, point of view. What does it mean uh, when, when you actually start to go agile and, and, and let other people introduce changes instead of uh, uh, the people who used to do it? Or, uh, you know, uh, there's always a conflict between developers and DBAs. Who should actually make changes? Uh, it used to be something very clear, you know, DBAs had hacks access and, and they made changes in, in on behalf of others, but that has changed and, 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 and the ones not changing are facing bottlenecks. And of course, as Eric said, you need to be able to measure everything. If that's uh, uh, lead time, uh, mean time between failures or, or just realizing what, what your uh, uh, failure rate is, is, is it going up, is it going down? So you need to measure everything and, and make sure that you have that for the whole end-to-end -end, uh, uh, environment, not just for your code, but for your code and uh, for your database. So, um, talking about the different components that, that we can help you with. Uh, I mentioned version control. So, if you have uh, uh, people working with sandboxes and, and nobody conflicts with the changes, there's not much that go, can go wrong. But just figure out uh, if you have a complex environment uh, maybe that's uh, that the application needs several databases, several servers just to spin up. 
I talked to a company who, who had such a, a, a elaborated uh, uh, development environment that they had to spin up dozens of, of servers just to simulate their, their environment. This is, of course, something that you cannot do to a developer. So they had shared databases. Uh, uh, everybody were accessing the same environment, the same database. And obviously, it was harder to synchronize uh, who's doing what. You could have gone to your Git or, or Subversion and check out that object in, in the source control, but that didn't prevent anybody from going directly to the database, database and making other changes. So an integrated uh, uh, solution for database in step locked with the source control is something that can save you a lot of trouble because you prevent people from overriding, overriding each other's code. You prevent code that gets into the database, maybe in development environment, from being overlooked while doing the build and moving to other environments. And of course, you know, it, it, there's always the, the joke about the developer that said, but it works on my environment. Nobody cares. It's all about creating that repeatable process and making sure that nothing breaks or, as, or, or things break as, as little as possible. Eric mentioned fast feedback loop. It's all about creating these fat, fast feedback loops and preventing uh, these wrong processes. So once you have your development process in place, uh, you need to, to see how you can actually do a, a, a repeatable and safe release process. Looking at best practices uh, that, that are highly used in, 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 in DevOps, in CI, CD processes, it, it's all about making sure that you, you are repeating the process. So you only build your code once, and you, you want to deploy it that build, you want to deploy it to every environment, and you want to deploy it the same way. So it sounds a, quite a, kind of trivial when you talk about, about code, because you have the compiled code, you copy the files, you copy the executables, and whatever you need. But as Eric said, databases are incremental. You cannot just take the database from, from development and put it in integration, and then QA and, 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 and production, because you'll override the content, the persistency of the data. So you need to incrementally change it. And if you're doing incremental changes, the base configuration becomes critical. What happens when you're not starting off where you think you are? So you might get wrong results. You might get inconsistencies. And of course, that defies the whole purpose of building once and, and, and deploying many. So we need to come up with a process that helps you do these release processes, but do them safely and in a controlled manner. So this is exactly uh, uh, what DMSO can do while understanding the content of your different environments. So yes, you want to move from, from dev to integration to QA to production, but what happens if production had a hotfix? Will, you, will your next release uh, already in place, planning to go forward? It's already in your integration environment. It's about to go to production. Would it just override the fix in production? You know, someone might say, well, you shouldn't put changes not through the release pipeline anyway and, and, and should have a better process. But this is reality. You know, we're talking to, to a lot of enterprises and a lot of smaller companies. It's always, you know, if, if, if the database is down, if something is wrong, you need to get that index in. You need to take, to take that procedure and fix it so things work for uh, 6 a.m. Then the DBA would come at 4 a.m. and fix it. And then you have to make sure that it doesn't break your process. So you know about these things and, 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 and make sure that it doesn't break your next release. Same way is why even break the, 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 the database? Let's say you have wrong code, you have syntax error, you have dependencies challenges within the code that, that, that you move into your integration environment. What best is uh, if not get a, a, a fast feedback loop and before you get, you can actually inter, uh, integrate that into the integration environment, get a message saying that code is going to fail. Again, a faster feedback loop, preventing errors, preventing downtime, and not breaking your database. So I talked about safety from uh, a configuration and a process point of view, but really many times uh, you know talking to to uh, to companies uh, I see the same tension and, and, and challenge between developers and, and DBAs so developers wants to be more agile they want to take uh, uh, 
as much as they can. They have their own goals. You know, we have to ship that process. We have to ship that task forward. But DBAs might be looking a bit more protective about the database because it's their responsibility. And that, that's perfectly fine. It's, it's, it's what they should do. So they would want to look at what maybe developers are doing, uh, make sure it's, they're, they're not dropping something that they shouldn't, they're not touching a specific object or table that, that they shouldn't, and, and they want to review things. But that makes them into a bottleneck. And even more so if they insist of running things themselves. So if you really want to start running faster, you don't have any choice. You have to uh, relinquish some of that control and, 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 and give uh, more people access into updating the database. But that doesn't mean that you have to do that while uh, relinquishing control about what is being pushed forward. So if a developer would drop a table in, in his development environment and that code somehow goes into uh, the next release pack, package or, or, or patch, this is something that you would never want to blindly go very efficiently through the different gates all the way to production. This is something that you want to stop as early as, as you can. So things like uh, dropping uh, uh, tables, anything that, that is data loss uh, uh, related, uh, security risks, known standard actions, even naming conventions could become policies uh, that the master can help you enforce on, on the automated process. And, and by doing so, you can actually uh, 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 make sure that the process runs faster and only things that should be stopped are actually stopped and other things can run faster. With the same concept, uh, where do the developer can actually push his code? All the way to production? Maybe only to QA environment? Maybe into integration? So clear uh, roles and responsibilities should and could be set so you actually build uh, uh, a conveyor belt which is very efficient but it has all of the different inspection machines on on the process to make sure that nothing is 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 done uncontrollably and then of course uh, once you start automating things you need to to know what happens so uh, auditing changes knowing exactly who did what when and, and and where can help all of you some of you have to comply with with socks and and and, and HIPAA and 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 aspects of, of GDPR and others would just want to troubleshoot more efficiently so knowing exactly what happened what user used what credentials log into what server and, and at what time frame was that change pushed forward and, and what was the content of that change can become a critical thing either for compliance or for efficiency and, 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 and process and, and recuperating from, from errors. And of course, as Eric said, you then need to start measuring things. Your, your uh, mean time between failures, your frequency of releases, the failure rate, maybe, maybe you're running very fast, but you're failing too much. If you're failing too much, that's not good. So zooming out a bit and trying to realize how a process would potentially look like. Uh, you have your urban code uh, implemented, running your, your application changes, pushing uh, application code to different uh, servers, calling DB Maestro to push the database uh, uh, pieces into different environments through the different gates that, that I've mentioned, but then as Eric said, and, and, and this is a, a, a lead up to, to Jay, you actually want to be more efficient. Maybe you don't have enough environments. Maybe you want to be very, very agile and not just use your two environments for QA. You want to now uh, uh, spin up another environment very efficiently to test your uh, rollout to production before you actually do it. So here is exactly how such a process would look. And, and, and this is exactly what the investor connects uh, to both uh, uh, urban code from one side and, and Actifio from the other. Actifio can very easily take a clone from production, which is, let's say, version 1.0, spin, spin it up as a new QA environment. But that QA environment would be version 1.1 at uh, 1.0, and DMaster could then upgrade that QA environment to 1.5. You could then do your automated testing on a simulated roll out to production. And the same thing happens when you want to roll out uh, a new sandbox. So you have a, a, a new development environment that you want to use. What's 
what's uh, 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 what's going to be easier than just saying, okay, just create one, spin up a new copy of production with the go with the good data that we want to use, masked in, in this way or another, and spin it up to the right version. So with a single click, you could have a sandbox with version two, so the developer could do his testing, and another QA with version 1.5, where they can do their testing. So of course. Uh, 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 this synergy is 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 uh, going both ways, as as we can see. And uh, uh, Jay, this is this is uh, uh, now up to you to to show us how you do that magic uh, uh, from Actifio's side. Yeah, and thanks. I appreciate it, it, and thanks everyone, of course, for uh, joining today. So I think I have control. So let me just go to the next slide here. Cool. And so I'm just starting here talking about. Um, Actifio and building on what Eric and Yaniv had said regarding how we manage the underlying data in databases. Because what you find is that data itself is sort of difficult. It has weight, it has gravity, and it doesn't really move very effectively. So, one second, I'm trying to next slide and it's not going. Maybe I hit the wrong button. Huh. Let me just see. So, Maybe one of you guys could see if I can get the side moving forward. I'm hitting next and it's not going. So maybe I don't have control, but we'll keep trying. I'll keep talking try, as if I did. Again. That? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Eric. Hmm, strange. Oh, there it went. Okay, cool. So the core problem really is what it comes down to for a lot of people is this idea that, you know, as Yaniv and Eric mentioned, you have these big databases. They're production. They're really important to your operations, and clearly you can't influence or impact them in a negative way. So what ends up happening is often with you know, this development, you struggle with database cloning. You struggle with getting copies of those databases. You know, for example, you know, I've been on many of conversations with customers, probably just like you, who either are working on databases that are copies of production that might be many months old, or even in more extreme cases, copies of production data that is not really representative. The database may be very large, and that copy may only be a few slides, or a few slides, sorry, let's look at the slide, a few rows. So it's not reflective, so that when you're doing your development, you're developing on something that is not necessarily an accurate representation of what production looks like, and so as it goes through development pipeline and finally reaches QA and things like that, you find that, oh, well, maybe you're encountering issues that you would have found earlier had you had access to a more representative data set than that subset that you have. Or to Yaniv's point earlier, you know, maybe you have a copy of the database that was provided to you at some point, but maybe since then production has changed, in which case you get all the way through the development pipeline only to find out that, as he said, there's a new hot fix or anything like that that causes a problem and basically forces you to relook at the process. The other piece to think about is, we, we live in that world thinking about that challenge, but the other element is, well, what about the cloud? You know, IBM Urban Code is a great product, and IBM Cloud also has, you know, Urban Code. So what if you want to start leveraging the cloud for development? How does that work? Because now when you think about, wait a second, we may want to get data as part of our development environment and maybe even copies of our development environment to the cloud. But if we do that, again, now our problem of how do we keep the production environment with the development environment and maintaining that connection while also ensuring security becomes a big challenge. And so what it yield leads to when doing this really is that you really get two big challenges because of this. The first is speed, right? As Yaniv had mentioned, we're doing this development, we're using old databases, maybe there's patches, maybe there's hot fixes, maybe there's other changes. And so it means that while you're developing on one set of data, the data that you're actually we're going to go to production on could be very different. And of course, the database that's production is changing rapidly over time as well. We all know production is never static. So of course, your development then is by very definition, the minute you get that database, it's outdated. So how can you make sure that the version that you're wor working on in the diagram we saw, you know, where that's 1.5 or 2.0 or whatever is as reflective of reality as possible. And then as an extension, we need to think about what we can do around the quality aspect. 
So we can get faster speeds by getting these database copies more up to date faster and also by getting those copies of those databases earlier, we can get it more efficient quality because now we're developing on a data set that's reflective of the actual customer data or the actual data we're using versus some kind of manufactured subset or manufactured data that's, that's quite old. Now, one of the challenges, of course, that we'll talk about as well is that if you think about that, okay, great, wouldn't it be fantastic to be able to get copies of this data? Certainly it would. But the challenge then becomes, you might be wondering, well, what about security? Or what about space efficiency? And we'll talk more about that because that's really, really important. And then, of course, we want to talk about self-service because DBAs are a very protective bunch, as they should be, because they know that databases are a critical part of the infrastructure. But yet, you need access to that data, and you need it in a way that is timely and, and reasonable, and you need to be sure that you do it in a way that you can get what you need, but the DBAs can also feel confident that their data is protected and managed in a way that makes sense for them, and so they can feel confident that there's not problems that per might be created through the development pipeline of the developers potentially doing something to production or some other piece of the database. And so what I want to talk for a second about is Actifio and what we do and kind of how it works because I feel like a lot of people hear this and think, wow, that's a great idea, but tell me a bit more because I think it's really important to think about the data in my environment. So what Actifio does is we basically integrate our technology with the underlying database that you might be running. So now we're talking about integration with production. So we basically take a, a small piece of software, we integrate with the production environment, and we capture incremental copies of production data in a very, very efficient way. Very low bandwidth, very low resource utilization. And what that allows us to do then is it captures this data and we then set policies that you could work with your DBAs or your application owners on around how frequently you want to capture that data. Because it's very, very light and very, very efficient, you capture it very frequently if you want it, although for development standpoint, you're probably okay with a database that's maybe a day old or two days old. But you could do it even more frequently than that if you have a very rapidly changing database or some other aspect. So we integrate with that. It doesn't matter where you're running, right? A lot of people talk about, you know, using the cloud or using containers or VMs or even traditional physical environments. We can integrate with all of those and pull this critical data using our technology, which we call virtual data pipeline. So what we do with virtual data pipeline is we then capture this data out of band in a way that doesn't affect the application performance. With that, we now have the ability to basically create this protected copy of those databases. Now the protected copy that we have is stored inside of Actifio and so is out of band. When what that means is it's no longer affecting production. So if you, for example, had a database from the Actifio system and you were to run a massive query that might bring a traditional system to its knees, it very well could bring the Actifio system down or you know, create impact on the Actifio system as well. But the key thing is, is that it won't impact performance. You are now effectively insulated from performance environment. But the real key here is this ability to think about, now that you've got a protected copy, what can you do with it? What can I do with this database copy or this application copy or whatever it might be to generate value in my development process? And this is where the magic really happens. We provide the ability to take the protected copy from any previous point in time and essentially provide that mounted as a fully read writable copy. So now we can take this production database and maybe we have four or five different developers working on it. They all can have their own copy, every single one. Those are logically separate copies. So if I make a change and delete a bunch of rows or columns or tables, I won't step on the person next to me who will happen to work in the same database and maybe making different changes. This is also really important because this process also leverages urban code. So the APIs of urban code can integrate with Actifio to create this process and also integrate with DB Maestro. 
So not only do we present that copy via Urban Code, but then Urban Code and DB Maestro can also work to roll that forward to the future versions because maybe you've already made changes. As Yaniv said, maybe the database is in version 1.0, that's production, and maybe you've made changes as part of your development to make it more efficient or to add new functionality and you want to roll it forward to version 2.0. You can do that automatically using DB Maestro, using Actifio. The really powerful thing is, and this gets to a question I made earlier, where people say, well, wait a second, I love this idea, but if I have this database and it's you know, five terabytes and I have 10 guys who want to work on it or 10 women who are in QA who want to work on it, doesn't that take 50 terabytes? And that's one of the magic of Actifio in that when you present these copies, you basically consume no additional disk space. So what that means is, is that the penalties that may be associated in the past with creating these copies and doing a lot of modifications as needed over time no longer exist. So it really frees you as a developer and frees the DBAs from having to worry about these complexities and these demands of constantly creating new copies and constantly allocating new storage for these copies over time. It also offers a lot of flexibility in how you configure it, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Oh, I forgot the next one. So it, the other piece is it also integrates fully with the cloud. So let's say you want to move your development, some piece of your development to IBM Cloud. Well, you can use the same technology to take your local database that you're using and push that into IBM Cloud and then dynamically provision copies in the cloud via urban code on demand. So this then enables this sort of hybrid cloud strategy that people are thinking about, where maybe you run production in one place, and it could even be in one cloud, and maybe you run development in a different place. It could be on-premises, it could be in the cloud. It doesn't matter. Or maybe you're a private cloud person, and of course it supports that as well. So what it really does is it frees this gravity, this heaviness of your underlying database data and exposes it so that your application developers, so that you folks can use it very efficiently, very rapidly in the way that you want it. And it incorporates controls because you don't want to be put in a situation where maybe you feel like you're at risk, that maybe there are certain fields that, that shouldn't be there or other areas that might be a concern. The technology has a full workflow module, including security aspects. So it can basically limit, so it can ensure that, you know what, you're working on a specific environment, so only you can see that environment. The developer next to you may work in a different environment, different database, different tables, and maybe they should only see that and nothing else. It also means that there's certain fields that are PCI compliant or otherwise private in nature. The same workflows can also integrate with masking tools to hide the data. So that, that way the database that you get is one that you can feel comfortable with that doesn't have information that might you know, be at risk or otherwise um, be a problem, particularly in today's highly regulated and litigious environment where we worry about things like that. So if we go to the last slide, I just want to sort of summarize quickly before passing it back to Eric. So the cool thing is, is that we can provision these multi-terabyte data sets instantly. This allows you to basically get them. For example, as I mentioned, it's not uncommon for us to meet with customers who are telling me that they're waiting days, weeks, or even months to get copies of databases. Well, we can provide these databases instantly and not only provide the native database themselves, but instantly refresh them on demand and, of course, you know, using tools like Urban Code and DB Maestro, it's all automated the process, and then we can roll it forward to make sure our DB schema of the newest version we're presenting matches the one that we're working on. And of course, as the image shows, it's very, very efficient from a space standpoint as I talked about. No additional disk space. This also allows for more efficient parallel testing, because now you can do more parallel, more tests in parallel on data, or even more efficient parallel development as all the developers can have their own database and develop them in parallel. We talked about how it works in any cloud. So it's coming in a second, I think, maybe. I don't know why it doesn't like me. There it is, any cloud. Now it's also storage agnostic because you may in your environment perhaps have one vendor storage, 
another environment may have a different vendor storage. The Actifio solution is simply a software appliance. It doesn't care what storage you use. So you can run it in now, see, it's like laggy or something. And so now it allows you to leverage any environment, public, private cloud. You could be a hypervisor or other traditional physical environments, virtual environments, or even containers, and certainly any cloud. The other nature of this is as you're developing your environment, there's different needs from a performance standpoint. For example, some customers or some developers in the early stage of the cycle, you know, for them, performance may not be as important. Maybe they're more about functionality testing as they're developing their features. But as you get further down the QA pipeline, now we're doing user acceptance testing. We definitely want to test performance. We definitely want to test it at scale. And so we have the ability to present these copies using different types of storage. So maybe in the early stages, maybe you use very inexpensive storage that has less performance, but that's okay. And then maybe as we get later down the development pipeline, we want to use very, very fast storage, say flash storage, because that's more representative of a production environment and representative of what we're looking to accomplish so that we can test in a very, very production-like instance. Talks about it being API driven. So it's all fully driven by urban code, uh, you know, can leverage DB Maestro, as I said, and, you know, it works with a whole development pipeline. Fairly straightforward there. And then, of course, we have the security. I talked about that, and the ability to automatically apply masks. So that way, the data you uh, data you get is data you can feel confident in, doesn't have sort of fields that might put you at risk because maybe it's social security numbers or something like that that are subject to strict regulations. Because we all know there's more and more of those regulations appearing every single day. Oh, and I think that was my last one. I'm sorry about that. So I was going to jump back. So Eric, it is all you. I will jump to your slide and pass it to you to talk about this general architecture side. So here I'll go, maybe. All right, so let's wrap it up. We've got uh, Q&A coming up here in a moment. This would be an excellent time to uh, start punching in questions into your Q&A panel uh, within the GoToWebinar experience. Um, I, I think we've said this, guys. Um, the key thing is that we all have DevOps tool chains these days. Um, there is no one DevOps tool that does all the DevOps, right? There are a lot of tricky problems here. And so these tools work together. So here is one model of that, right? Um, we can use something like urban code deploy uh, to deploy application change into an environment or even to request a new environment from some sort of cloud infrastructure or even VMware. Um, so we can get the infrastructure, we can get the application code into the environment. But that's not useful without data and updating uh, the, the database itself. And so that's where it's going to have those integrations um, directly to something like Actifio, right? Uh, the Actifio team wrote that integration. So that we can call that, get the test data in there. Um, Actifio has those workflows so that it can call out to a tool like uh, our Optum test data management to mask that data. Or Urban Code could call that tool um, to, to mask the, the data. Right? A couple ways of doing it, make that easy for you to pick. Right? We then need to make sure that the database is updated, the schema changes are all applied, that the new indexes are in there, that we take what's in production, we make it what it ought to be for our tests. Um, DB Maestro will do that for us. It'll also allow us to run that same sort of uh, change in production in a consistent way. All right? The reason we can go faster, the reason we can deploy to production more often is that we test well and we deliver the change into production in a way that causes less, less failure per change, right? That's really what we're doing here. The, the permission slip that allows you to go faster is not just that you have a button to click and you can put your app in production. 
but it's that when you press that button, production doesn't catch on fire and burn down. So everything we're doing um, is about driving both speed and quality, All right? Because speed is imperative to the success of the business, but if production is down, yeah, you would have been better with what you had yesterday, right? So those two things go together. Uh, with that final comment, um, I would like to pass it back to Alan uh, and open it up for uh, any questions that we have. Great. Hey, guys, uh, Eric, Jay, Yanev, great job. I mean, I, I thought this was a great discussion, some great slides, great illustrations. Um, we do have quite a bit of uh questions here so let's jump into it the first one I, I i think it i think it might be a misunderstanding but let me just make clear because uh, the person was nice enough to ask and that is uh, it's more of a statement the dora report shows that team that go teams that go faster actually break far less things so speed increases quality please explain a statement about how going faster means more errors that seems to be a myth that's been thoroughly debunked. Un, you know, help us understand the analysis. Uh, Alan, uh, this is Yaniv. I think this question is to me and, and, and the slide yes. I shared about uh, about uh, uh, frequent releases and, and the rate of failures. Uh, so first of all, uh, definitely Dora Reports discusses uh, uh, DevOps processes and, and, and working with the new like methodologies and best practices. And I think this is exactly where the problem starts. First of all, Dora does not uh, uh, look at specifically at databases. And the problem with databases is that they're not following the same processes. This is exactly why this is a problem to begin with. You're practicing processes like you did uh, uh, 10 years ago and 20 years ago and you're just trying to go faster. Actually, one of the things that we found out, in, in I, I quoted, I think, a few, a few uh, uh, results from our survey. I, I, I can post the whole survey in the chat if people are interested to see more. But one of the things that we saw is that actually, when we talk about the database, people are not practicing proper processes. That was hard to say. But, uh, they're not using automation tools. The, the, the DBAs would even, as we found out, would even sometimes manually type commands in production to make things happen. Nobody would dream to do that when, when, when they talk about like code release, okay? But this is exactly the, the gap and, and the database needs to play by the same rules. So the surveys that uh, I quoted uh, are, are brand new, so from uh, early 2018, I'll post uh, the link for the whole results, but this is what we saw. With the processes people are running today for the database, uh, unfortunately, when they try to gap uh, modern processes with uh, semi-manual processes of the database, it doesn't work. That's exactly part of the problem, and, and I hope it, it answered the question, but uh, if not, I'll be happy to, to to get into more details one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And, and anyway, sure. I, I posted uh, uh, the URL to the, to the full survey if anybody wants to look at it uh, in the chat uh, yeah. box. So, so that so, is you know, in your chat section, guys. You can click the link within chat. Yeah. And you'll see that's a uh, DB Maestro link there. Uh, but Yanov, I think that does explain what you were trying to get to. In, uh, Good explanation. This next question, I think, is more for Jay, and it's Actifo, Actifio specific. And they want to know: yeah. Does Actifio support all relational databases like Oracle, DB2, Postgres, and others? And First, if Alan, not, what are the limits? Can you hear me? Okay, I had some computer snafus and had to log out and log back in. I, I think you can. Hear no, me no, you good. sound. We hear you good. Fantastic. So indeed, it does. I mean, it integrates with all the you know leading sort of traditional databases, things like SQL and Oracle. It also integrates with the leading sort of Linux databases, you know, things like Postgres and, you know, MySQL and MongoDB, things like that. So indeed it does. 
and it leverages incremental forever capture on all of them. So it's very, very efficient in terms of how I talked about how we can be very minimal impact on the production databases. We use that same technology across all those different environments. So in fact, to the questioner's point, it makes it very, very easy to leverage it in a heterogeneous environment where you've got lots of different databases and you want to orchestrate using you know, DB Maestro and Urban Code and Activia. Fantastic. Okay. The next one is, is a, I guess, a request for help, and it's open to anyone on the panel. This particular listener is looking for any, uh, she's looking, or he or she, is looking for a data virtualization tool by creating, uh, for creating databases for test data management. Any, any ideas where we could point? Well, I think that the, one of the big use cases that we often see in SJ is exactly that for Actifio. And so, in fact, people typically use Actifio for test data management because it provides that ability to dynamically spin up these database copies very, very efficiently. So it allows you to create virtually unlimited copies of these production databases for test data management purposes. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, well, you know, we provide that in all the workflows, but obviously, you know, you can further add to the solution by leveraging sort of the integrated tool, integrated approach provided by Urban Code, and of course, the, um, you know, DB versioning as delivered by DB Maestro, and I'm sure they can talk more about the broader solution, but I feel like that really aligns closely with what we're talking about here today. Great. Um, we're running out of time, but I got to, Eric, this looks like a question for you. How do you actually manage parallel development streams with these tools? I mean, the IBM Urban Code piece seems to make sense, but when everyone has a data copy of their own and are adding, dropping tables and such, doesn't it turn into chaos? Uh, it, it certainly can, and, and I think we all have our stories here around parallel development and, and how we bring that together. Um, the reality, though, is the, the best practice in our market is trunk-based development. Um, modern source control tools, uh, workflows uh, set aside. Um, the quicker you do continuous integration, we're going back now 20 years in best practice, the sooner my code is in the same stream as your code, and then that is being realized and tested in an environment, the less pain we're going to have when my change conflicts with your change. So it, it's great if I've got my own uh, database on the side and I'm making my own changes, I can validate that, cool. But that's got to hit source code, it's got to be merged with my colleagues and it's got to be validated in a testing environment as quickly as possible. And if we conflict, and it was a change I made 10 minutes ago, okay, we'll go deal with that conflict and we'll know it was my change and your change. If we wait two weeks to do that, uh, we're gonna be miserable, we're gonna hate ourselves. So just do continuous integration um, and, and reset your data based on production on a regular basis, bring it up to the latest schema, uh, get the application out there. Um, that, that's my core advice. Excellent. Um, guys, we're about at the top of the hour. Just one last question that I'm going to answer, and that was someone wanted to know how did they get a copy of the presentation. Uh, this webinar, like all DevOps.com webinars, are usually available within 24 to 48 hours on DevOps.com and on our YouTube channel, which is DevOps TV, uh, all one word on YouTube, and you can usually get the entire replay of the webinar, including slides in audio. Uh, again, usually within 24 hours. Uh, so you can check it out there. Guys, that brings us to the top of the hour. First of all, IBM, Activio, and DB Maestro. Actifio and DB Maestro. Thank you so much for sponsoring today's webinar. Yaniv, Eric, Jay, great job, guys. Love to have you back on. I think this is a topic that deserves more of a spotlight and, and more of a discussion. So if we could do that some point in the future. But Sounds for great. now, we're going to, yep, thank you guys. For now, we're going to call it a wrap. This is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com. Hope to see you soon on another DevOps.com webinar. Have a great day, everyone.
Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks.